My message this morning is entitled Losing Control. Losing Control. This past week was Purim. I don't know if you knew that. This coming week is St. Patrick's Day. Probably did know that. But besides these holidays, there's a lot of things going on in the news. There's the virus, the stock market, the election and the politics, and all the trials going on. And uh, it's just, how do you deal with it all? How do you control it? Especially when these things are really outside of our control. And I think the source of our problem and our anguish and our fear is this. That we think somehow we have to control our circumstances to survive. The natural reaction when we're not in control is to freak out, to panic. Our security blanket is gone. We want it back. So I want us to look at this idea today of being in control and how do we react when we're losing control. And I think uh, we can start by just having a quick study of the story of Purim, which is appropriate this time of year. I think it's a good way to start. Let me begin with prayer. Lord, thank you for this time, this moment. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your words that you've given us. That uh, you're not a God that's out there in the dark, but one who has uh, shined light on every circumstance. You've given us your words that we know your thoughts. And I pray, Lord, that you would open up our hearts and our ears so we can hear what you'd have to say to us today. I pray this in the name of our Messiah. Amen. So let me start by reading, and I know I have some long sections of scripture here this morning, but I think they're going to be very helpful. I'm going to start with reading the book of Esther. Um first chapter. This is what happened in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. I looked at that on the map. That's pretty much the whole Mideast, Saudi Arabia, Iran, you know, all the, that whole area. 127 provinces. At that time, King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in the castle in Shushan, which is uh, in Iran today. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all of his princes and his servants. Think about that. Not just the royalty, but the workers. The military leaders of Persia and Media and the nobles and the officials of the provinces were present. He displayed his vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor of his glory and his majesty for many days, 180 days. And when these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days in the garden court of the king's palace for all the people who were present in the palace of Shushan, both the greatest to the least. There were white and blue linen curtains hung by cords of fine linen, purple on silver rings, marble columns, gold and silver couches on a mosaic pavement of alabaster, marble, mother of pearl and minerals. Wow. Wine was served in golden goblets, each of which was different from one another. And the royal wine was abundant according to the king's wealth. In keeping with the law, there was no restrictions on drinking, for the king had instructed the supervisors of his household to comply with each person's desire. In addition to all this, Queen Vashti held a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Hashaveros. So it was a big party, and as custom, 
The women were separate, but the queen had her own big party as well. Now on the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who attended Achiveros, the king, to bring Queen Vashti before the king wearing the royal crown. He wanted to show the peoples and the officials her beauty, for she was very attractive. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command, conveyed by the eunuchs. How dare she? He's the king. He's in control. And she says, no, no, I'm not your your trophy. I'm not your, you know, you, you can't just command me to do what you want. The king became furious and burned with anger. Yeah. And he consulted the wise men who discerned the times. For it was the king's practice to consult experts in matters of law and justice. So he's a wise man. He didn't let his anger control him. He sought out um, wisdom and guidance. Now those closest to him were Karshina, Shetar, Admatha, Tarshish, Meres, Marsna, and Memukan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who had access to the king's present. They were highest in the kingdom. By law, what is to be done with Queen Vashti for failing to obey the command of King Achshuveros, conveyed by the eunuchs? Then Memukan answered in the presence of the king and all the princes, Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also all the princes and all the peoples who are in all of the provinces of King Ashoveros. So she set an example for everybody. For the queen's conduct will go out to all the women, making their husbands contemptible in their eyes, by saying, King Ashoveros commanded Queen Vashti to be brought in before him, but she would not come. This very day, the noblemen of Persia and Media who have heard of this matter concerning the queen will respond similarly to all the king's princes. There will be no end to the contempt and anger. I think they were right. Cause a real woman's movement. Women are going to be in charge. If it, it's not a bad thing, but if the king's in charge, the king should be in charge. If it pleases the king, let a royal commandment go forth from him. Let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti may not come into the presence of King Ashkaveros, and let the king give her royal status to another who is more worthy than she. Then the king's edict, which he shall enact, will be proclaimed through all his vast kingdom. And then all the wives will give their husbands honor from the greatest to the smallest. And the matter pleased the king and the princes. So the king did according to the word of Memukan. And he sent letters throughout all the royal provinces. To each province in its own script. To each people in its own language that every man should be in charge of his own household and be able to speak the language of his own people. Wow. So who's in control? Well, the king's supposed to be in control, but the wife wanted to be in control. Now the king won, and as a result, now the tradition that every man is in charge of his house Uh, If you wonder where it came from, I think that's where it came from. But the king listened to his advisors. And uh, the next chapter, what I'm not going to read, is a beauty contest. The king has to pick someone to replace his queen. And Esther was picked, and she becomes the new queen. Now let's pick it up in chapter 3. I'm just going to read a few verses here. Sometime later, King Achshuveros promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite. 
and elevated him and set his chair above all officials who were with him. All the king's servants who were at the king's gate would bow down and pay honor to Haman, for the king had commanded it. But Mordechai would not bow down or pay him honor. And the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordechai, Why are you disobeying the king's command? And day after day they spoke to him, but he would not listen to them. Therefore they went to Haman, told him in order to see whether Mordechai's resolve would prevail, because he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordechai was not bowing down or paying him honor, then Haman was filled with rage. Who's in control? It was repugnant in his eyes to lay hands on only Mordechai, because they told him the identity of Mordechai's people, so Haman sought to destroy all the Jews the people of Mordechai, who were throughout the whole kingdom of Achshaveros. Well, we see the same thing happening, not between uh, the, the king and his wife, but now it's between Haman and Mordechai. Who's in control? Who's in charge? Haman is, you know, elevated way up high, and Mordechai... He refuses to bow down in worship. Of course, his motive was a lot different than Queen Vashti. Uh, He's saying, I'm Jewish. I honor the living God. I'm not going to bow down to anything or anyone else. So that was a good thing. And just like Vashti before him would have set an example for all women... Now Mordechai is setting an example for all Jews. And just like Mordechai, we need to understand, listen to this. Our actions don't just affect us. But we are representatives of God and whatever we do sets an example for the whole world to see this is what God is like. This is what God's people are like. So Mordechai was saying, you know, this is who I am. And Haman said, this is who all the Jewish people are. And when people see us and how we react to things, they have every right to say, this is how Christians are. We need to remember that. And I think it's true. Mordechai stood up to Haman And Haman had to do something about it. So uh, a few more verses, starting verse 13 of chapter 3, Esther 3.13. So dispatches were sent by couriers into all the king's provinces, stating that they were to destroy, slay, and annihilate all the Jews, from the youth to the elderly, both little children and women, on a single day, the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. I wouldn't be surprised if that 13th day was a Friday. Maybe that's where the tradition of Friday the 13th came from. But uh, 13th day of the 12th month, and a copy of this edict was to be issued as law in every province, made known to all people so that they would be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly with the king's command, and the edict was issued in the palace of Shushan. The king and Haman then sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was in shock, confusion. They couldn't understand what was happening. Now, you need to understand that this wasn't just, all right, this is what you're allowed to do. This was now the law. This is what you must do. You must kill all the Jews, women and children. Uh, 
So now, because of one act that Mordechai did, everyone has to pay. Because of one act that Adam did, everyone has to pay. Because of one act that Yeshua did, the payment has been made for everyone. But now there's a problem. All the Jewish people, the whole Jewish race, is doomed. And the Jewish people are all in their, house, uh, in their homes and they've lost control of everything. I mean, the law says they have to be killed. They lost everything, even their own lives. So how do you make this problem go away? What can you do? This is the problem. Everyone's life is at stake. You talk to the person who is in control. That's what you're going to do. Talk to the person who's in control. Mordechai tells Esther, talk to the king. He's in control. And uh, let's hear Esther's response. Chapter 4, starting verse 11. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces... They fully understand that for anyone, man or woman, who approaches the king in the inner courtyard without being summoned, there's but one law. He has to be put to death. Unless the king extends his golden scepter, permitting him to live. And I have not been summoned to come to the king for at least 30 days. And they conveyed Esther's words to Mordechai, and Mordechai told them to reply to Esther with this answer. Do not think in your soul, in your heart, that you will escape in the king's household any more than all the other Jews. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Who knows? Maybe you have attained this royal status for such a time as this. Very famous words. So even if you think that you're not allowed to, you still have to try. And Esther was willing to give up her life to try. I thank God that we now have full access to the King of Glory. I mean, in uh, the time of Moses, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. And only once a year. And only after many sacrifices. You just could not go into the presence of the Lord. But now, free access to all who are willing to come. Hallelujah. Yeshua is that golden scepter that allows us free access to the King of Kings. Well, what was the king's answer? Uh, Esther was allowed to go in. She spoke to the king. The king says, whatever you want, I'll do it. And Esther says, well, uh, let's have a big party and let's have Haman come. They went and they had the party and the king says, okay, now tell me what you want. She says, I want to have another party tomorrow. Let's have the king uh, have Haman come again. Okay, let's pick it up, Esther chapter 7. So the king and Haman came to dine with Queen Esther And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king asked Esther again, whatever you request, even as much as half of my kingdom, it'll be given to you. Remember, he had a big kingdom. And the queen Esther answered, oh, if I found favor in the eyes of the king, if it pleases the king, let me live. Grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare the life of all my people. This is my request. And the king's going, what? Huh? 
That's all you want? You want to live? She says, well, we've been sold, I and my people, for destruction, for slaughter, for annihilation. Now, if it was simply that we were going to be sold as male and female slaves, I would have stayed silent. For such distress would not be worth disturbing the king. King Achshaveros responded to the queen, Who is he? Who is this one that would do such a thing as this? Esther replied, The man, the adversary and foe, is this man, this wicked Haman. And then Haman was terrified. I mean, he was going around boasting all day how special he was. And now he's terrified for his life before the king and the queen. And enraged, the king got up from the banquet of wine and withdrew to the palace garden. But Haman stayed behind to plead with Queen Esther for his life. He realized the king had determined something catastrophic for him. Yeah, I I guess so. And when the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, what did he see? Haman was falling on the same couch where Esther was. And the king exclaimed, Will you also assault the queen while she's here with me in the palace? As soon as these words came out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. You know, the black hood. Off with his head. I mean, whoa. Well, before they had a chance to chop his head off... Harbona, one of the eunuchs that were attending the king, said, Look, look, there's a gallow 50 cubits high standing next to his house. Haman himself made it to hang Mordechai, who spoke only good things for the king. Hmm. The king said, Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordechai, and the king's rage subsided. Well, so this took care of the source of the problem. But the problem is still there. Everyone's going crazy about testing for this virus. Okay, you test it, you know you have it, you know you don't have it. But it doesn't take the problem away. The Jewish people were still set to be slaughtered. Well, part two of the king's answer. Chapter 9, starting verse 7. Um, King Achshavero said to Queen Esther and to Mordechai the Jew, I've decided to give Haman's estate to Esther. And I had him hanged on the gallows because he stretched out his hand against the Jews. Now, You can write in the king's name on behalf of the Jews, whatever seems good to you. Seal it with the king's signet ring for a decree that is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. The law of the Persian and the Medes. So the king's scribes were called at that time on the 23rd day of the third month, the month of Sivan. And it was written according to all that Mordechai commanded to all the Jews and to all the officials and governors and advisors of all the 127 provinces that stretched from India to Ethiopia. To each province it was written in its own script, in its own language, and also to all the Jews in their own writing and language. And this decree was written in the name of King Ashavero, sealed with the king's ring, And it was sent by horseback, by couriers, who rode on the king's special horses, specially bred for their speed. All haste. They didn't have cell phones, didn't have internet. They just had the fastest horses. The king granted the right for Jews in every city to assemble themselves and to protect themselves to destroy, kill, and annihilate any army of any people 
or province that might attack them and their women and children and to plunder their possessions. The king granted the right for Jews in every city to assemble themselves and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, annihilate any army, any people, any province that might attack them and their women and their children, and to plunder their possessions. And the day that was appointed for this in all the provinces of King Ashaveros was the 13th day of the 12th month, so the same day. And a copy of the written edict was distributed to every province and made known to the peoples of every nationality so the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves of their enemies. And you could read the rest of the book of Esther and you'll see that they did just that. Sometimes, a lot of times, God doesn't take away our problems. Instead, he gives us the ability to deal with them to fight them. And I noticed something just now as I was reading this. It was a law to kill all the Jews. But the answer was, you have permission to fight against it. You're not required to. So I suppose if there was some family there that says, nah, 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 I don't have to, I'm not going to. Well, they would have been killed. God gives us his power, his permission to fight the devil, to fight all that's coming against us. And yet, we have the right to do it or to refuse to do it. And then we can't blame God if we get attacked because we didn't take up the arms, the full armor of God. We didn't do what was necessary to protect ourselves, to fight against all that's coming against us. You know, sin is the same way in our lives as well. God didn't really take away our sin as much as he gave us a way to deal with it. Uh, Turn to Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 4. It's a long section here I want to read, but the rest of chapter 7 and beginning of chapter 8. We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm flesh, and I'm sold as a slave to sin. I don't understand what I'm doing, because I do not practice what I want to do, and I'm doing what I hate. Now, if I'm doing what I don't want to do, and I agree with the law that it's good, so that I'm no longer the one doing it, it's the sin in me. I know nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. The desire to do what's good is with me, but there's no ability to do it. I do not do the good that I want to do. And I'm practicing the very evil I do not want to do. Now, if I do what I do not want, then I'm no longer really the one that's doing it. It's the sin that's living in me. So I discover this law. When I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. For my inner self, I delight in God's law, but I see a different law in the parts of my body that are waging war against the law of my mind and takes me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. You know, the old expression, mind over matter? It's not working for Paul. It doesn't work for us. What a wretched man that I am! Who can rescue me from this body of death? Well, thanks be to God through Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. So then, with my mind, I am serving the law of God, but with my flesh, I'm serving the law of sin. And God's answer, therefore, chapter 8, there is now no condemnation for those in Messiah Yeshua. Because the law of the spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua has set you free from the law of sin and death. So mind over matter doesn't work. But the Spirit of God does. And what the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did it. He he condemned sin in the flesh by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering, in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
For those who live according to the flesh would have their minds set on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. And now the mindset of the flesh leads to death. But the mindset of the Spirit is life and peace. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God. It's not even able to submit to God's law. Indeed, it's unable to do so. So, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you, however, are not in the flesh. You're in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Messiah, then he does not even belong to him. Now, if Messiah is in you, The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Yeshua from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Messiah from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. You see what's happening? God didn't remove sin. He removed our condemnation of sin. He removed the penalty of sin. But sin is still there, still trying to control us. But he's given us the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. He's given us the power to overcome it, to fight it. And so it's still our choice daily, moment by moment. Do we let sin control us? Do we let the Spirit of God control us? Who wants to control us? Are we out of control? We're helpless to control it in our own flesh. But with the power of the Spirit of God that he's given us, we do have the power over sin. Galatians 5.16, we should all know it by heart. I say then, walk by the Spirit. You will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Amen. Walk by the Spirit. You will not carry out the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh are strong. I know. As long as I live in this body, I know. But the Spirit of God is stronger. So, now, how, does we, how do we deal with the issues that we're facing today? This virus that you can't stop listening about. The stock market crashing the election cycle and all the debates and and then there's all these uh, court decisions and trials going on and it's overwhelming. It makes you want to crawl in a corner and cry. And we're not in control. What do we do about it? We're losing control. So do we panic? Do we take control by buying all the toilet paper we can find? What do we do? Let's see what God says we should do. Luke chapter 12, starting verse 16. Yeah, that'll do it. Buy lots of toilet paper. Now we're in control. Okay. Luke 12, chapter 12, verse 16. Yeshua told them a parable saying, The land of a certain rich man produced good crops. And he began to think to himself, saying, What shall I do? I don't have enough room to store all my harvest. He said, Yes, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build larger ones. Then I'll store all my grain and my goods and I'll say to myself, Oh, my soul, you have plenty of goods saved up for many years. I have a big IRA and I can retire. So take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, tonight your soul is being demanded. Now what are you going to do? What have you prepared for those that will be after you? And it will be like this for the one who stores up treasure for himself, but is not rich towards God. Yeshua said to his disciples, I'm telling you, Do not worry about your life, about what you're going to eat or your body or what you're going to wear because life is more than food and your body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They don't sow or reap. 
And they have no storeroom or barn, but God feeds them. How much more valuable you are than birds. And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? So, if you can't even do something very little, why do you worry about all these other things? Consider the lilies, how beautiful they are, how they grow. They don't toil or spin. But I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his glory was clothed like one of these. And if God so clothes the grass in the field, which here today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more will he clothe you, you people of little faith? Do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and don't keep worrying about these things, for all the nations of the world strive after these things, but your Father knows that you need these things. Instead, seek first his kingdom. All these things shall be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father is close to give you to the kingdom. I'm sorry, your Father chose to give you the kingdom. So God's response to all of this, yes, these things are all around us. They're cause for fear. But that's because we're looking at ourselves and we're looking at the problem. When we look at God, when we seek first his kingdom, just don't worry about these things. God is in control. He is in charge. And we don't have to worry about any of these things. Yes, we still should take what precautions we have to take. But we do not need to fear or panic. And it would be wrong for us to try to take control of these things because God is in control. And it's not for us to be in control. Just have to trust God. Uh, I want to read some more. I know this message is a little longer than my typical message, but Jeremiah 18, a few verses from here. This is the word the Lord spoke to Jeremiah. Go down to the potter's house. I'll give you my message there. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the potter's wheel, and he was using his hands to make a pot from the clay, and something went wrong. So instead, he used the clay to make a different pot, the way he wanted it to be. And the Lord spoke his word to me. Children of Israel, can't I do the same thing with you, says the Lord? You're in my hands like clay in the potter's hands. And there may come a time when I'll speak about a nation or a kingdom and I will pull it up by its roots or that I will pull it down to destroy it. But if the people of that nation stop doing the evil that they were doing, I will change my mind and not carry out my plans to bring disaster to them. There may come a time, another time, when I will speak about a nation and I will build them up and I will plant them. But if I see it doing evil and not obeying me, I will change my mind and not carry out my plans to do good for them. So say this to the people of Judah and those who live in Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I'm preparing disaster for you, making plans against you. Stop doing evil. Change your ways and do what is right. And then the people of Judah will answer, it's not going to do any good to even try. We're going to continue to do what you want. Each of us will do whatever our stubborn, evil heart wants. Wow. Think maybe God is telling us something? Not even just the USA, but the whole world. Talk about evil in this world. Evil in this country. It's everywhere. You can't avoid it. I could go on and on and on, but I think we all know what I'm saying. Now, here's a prophecy from Isaiah chapter 45. And there are many preachers today, even some from years ago, who are saying that this could easily be applying to our president, Trump. 
Isaiah 45. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him, to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you. I will level mountains. I will break down gates of bronze. I will cut through bars of steel. And I will give you hidden treasures, riches that were stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord. I am the God of Israel who summons you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, and Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name. And I bestow on you a title of honor, though you haven't known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there's no God. And I will strengthen you, though you haven't known me, so that from the rising of the sun to its place of its setting, people may know that there's none besides me. I am the Lord. There is no other. I form light. I create darkness. I bring prosperity. And I create disaster. I, the Lord, am doing all these things. Oh, you heavens above, rain down my righteousness. Let the clouds shower it down. Let the earth open wide. Let salvation spring up. Let righteousness flourish along with it. I, the Lord, have created this. Woe to those who quarrel with their maker. To those who are nothing but potsherds, among potsherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Will your work say, the potter has no hands? Woe to the one who says to a father, what have you begotten? Or to a mother, what have you brought forth to, uh, birth to? This is what the Lord God says. The Holy One of Israel and its maker, concerning things that are coming, do you question me about my children or give me orders about the work of my hands? It is I who made the earth and created mankind on it. My own hands stretched out the heavens. I marshaled all the starry host. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness. I will make all his ways straight. He will be rebuild my city and set my exiles free. But not for a price or a reward, says the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord says. The products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush. I could add China. All those tall Sabaeans, they will come over to you. They will be yours. And they will trudge behind you, coming over to you in chains. They will bow down before you. They will plead with you, saying, Oh, surely God is with you, and there is no other. There is no other God. Truly, you are a God who has been hiding himself, the God and Savior of Israel. All the makers of idols will be put to shame and disgraced. They will go off into disgrace together, but Israel will be saved by the Lord with an everlasting salvation. You'll never be put to shame or disgrace to ages everlasting. For this is what the Lord God says, He who created the heavens, He is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, He founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but He formed it to be inhabited. And he says, I am the Lord, there is no other. I have not spoken in secret. From somewhere in the land of darkness, I have not said to Jacob's descendants, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak the truth, and I declare what is right. Gather together and come, assemble you fugitives of the nations. Ignorant are those who carry about idols of wood, who pray to gods that cannot save. Declare what is to be and present it. And let them take counsel together. So who has foretold this from long ago? Who declared it from the distant past? Wasn't it I, the Lord? And there's no God apart from me, a righteous God and a Savior. There's none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, and by me every tongue will swear. And they will say of me in the Lord alone our deliverance and strength. Hallelujah. All who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. 
But all the descendants of Israel will find deliverance in the Lord and will make their boast in him. Wow. So that's the heart of God. He wants the whole world to know him. God loves us. But we need to think bigger. We all know John 3.16 by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But whenever we read it, we tend to see it differently. For God so loved us that he gave his only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish. And if we're sharing this word with somebody else, we want him to say, God so loves you that he gave his only life. And that's true. But that's not what the word says. God so loved the world. We have to think bigger. Yes, God loves us. But he loves the whole world. His picture is the whole world. Now God is serious about that whole message. The whole world needs to hear it. The whole world needs to have salvation. But how do you give that message so that the whole world would even listen? What can you do? What would it take to get the whole world's attention? Hmm. Something's happening now where the whole world has attention. God would need to do something on a global scale, something so large that it affects everyone in the world, every language, every people. Wow. My wife, she recently posted something on Facebook, and I think it was spot on. And this is what she posted. God is saying, okay, you're going to have to stay put. No more ball games to go to or watch on TV. No more social activities you can go to. No restaurants you can go to. No more traveling. No more cruises. I'm stopping everything, everywhere. Are you finally going to listen? Am I getting your attention yet? Yeah, I think God is saying that. When we see what's happening in the world today, we mustn't think we're losing control, we're out of control. Because God is and always has been in control. We need to see this from God's viewpoint. God's way of getting people's attention. Why? For the message of salvation. People are looking for answers now. And we need to pray earnestly that God's message would go out and be heard. Yes, we're praying about the virus, about people's health, but it's bigger than that. We need to be praying that this opportunity before us now, where people have God's attention, that they will see and hear the message of salvation. They would come to God and receive what God so willingly wants to offer. And we praise God. The president declared today is a national day of prayer. And we have full access to the one who is truly in control. We need to pray. And we need to do more. Just like Esther. We need to be ready to take every opportunity to speak the gospel. To be that one to give the message in every situation. Even if may cost you your life. And we should be asking ourselves, who knows, maybe I'm in this situation for such a time as this. Thank you for your time. And let's pray. Lord, you are doing something. You have been doing something in the world. And Lord, let us not turn the blind eye to us. Let us take this and every opportunity To say, wake up. See what God is doing. He loves you. He wants you to come to you. He wants you to turn from your evil ways. Lord, this country, even though there's so many Christians in it, it's still evil. How they try to do away with the word of God. They try to do away with everything that represents God. 
They take it out of the schools. They want to take it out of government. They want to take it out of our lives. Lord, you're God. You're in control. And we rebuke that. And we, we pray against it now. That instead your word would prevail. And everyone would hear it. And everyone would respond to it. And Lord, let people now start coming to you in repentance and in faith, knowing that you forgive and that you grant healing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. Okay, thank you.